Good evening, everyone. This is Raphael Craw, and welcome uh, to the Craw Lecture Series this evening. Um, the Craw Lecture Series features acclaimed UC Santa Cruz scientists and technologists who are grappling with some really, really big research questions. Tonight, Marm Kilpatrick, Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, returns to the Craw Lecture. He previously joined us last June at the then height of the COVID-19 pandemic and presented what we knew about how epidemiologists were homing in on the best strategies to move forward to prevent widespread transmission and provide treatments. Tonight, he returns to help shed some light on the COVID-19 vaccines, their effectiveness in fighting the disease and whether the vaccines are protective against the new variants of the uh, COVID-19 virus. You may remember tonight's moderator from her 2018 Crawl Lecture, Bugs, Bones, and Ancient DNA. Beth Shapiro is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology here at UC Santa Cruz. She's also a professor and investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Professor Shapiro received a bachelor's and master's degree in ecology from the University of Georgia and her doctorate of philosophy and zoology from Oxford University. Her research aims to better understand how populations and species change through time, particularly in response to environmental and other changes to their habitat. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, share a few details about the mechanics of the event tonight. We are using a webinar tool, so there's no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program. And we invite you to submit your questions in the Q&A box at any time. Um, finally, tonight's event will be recorded, and I'll turn us over to Beth. Thank you. And I'm just going to take this moment to briefly introduce Marm so that we can just get started, because I'm, I know that there are already a ton of questions that we'd like to get to in the end, and I'm sure that more will, more will arise during Marm's talk. Marm is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at UC Santa Cruz. His research addresses basic and applied questions on the ecology and epidemiology of infectious diseases. His past work has included studies on zoonotic diseases, including West Nile virus, Lyme disease, and Nipah virus. His work on SARS-CoV-2 includes studies of the age-specific fatality of COVID-19, the infectious period, and improving the efficiency and impact of contact tracing. He's contributed to the development of a COVID-19 testing program at UCSC and serves on several COVID-19 task forces and advisory groups in Santa Cruz County at UCSC and for the University of California. So without any further ado, allow me to introduce tonight's speaker, Marm Kilpatrick. Thank you very much, Beth. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. So today, the talk is really going to try to focus on uh, the big questions about the new COVID vaccines that we all are, are know, know about, the variants that we're all hearing about more and more and more, and what the road looks like going ahead. So I have three big goals tonight. As I'm sure all of us are aware, the news is just filled with an endless barrage of information. And I think if I find it hard, I think everyone finds it hard to really understand uh, what it means. So my number one goal tonight is to really give you tools to interpret new information on both vaccines and variants as it comes, as it arises. The second goal is to summarize what we currently know and don't know about both vaccines and variants. Um, and, and while I'll try to do that, I will preface that things are changing literally every day. And so what's more important than the information I'm gonna give you is actually the tools to interpret new information that's gonna come up tomorrow. And then finally, I'm gonna try to use the information that we do have about the vaccines we have and the variants that we have um, excuse me, virus variants, and what that means about the likely future scenarios and what really the uncertainties are and why that makes precise long-term predictions difficult or risky. Okay, so I'm gonna start out by just describing the COVID-19 vaccines and how they work. Um, there is just an enormous, enormous number of vaccines in the works at various stages of development. Um, and there's a bunch of tools out there if people wanna to try to keep up to date with what's happening. Um, the New York Times has a nice uh, website that's devoted to all the different vaccines in development. And I've lifted, listed that um, uh, link at the bottom here. Uh, in the US, we have two vaccines that have received emergency use authorizations from the FDA, um, one which I'll sometimes call the Pfizer vaccine and one, time, one I'll sometimes call the Moderna vaccine. Both of these vaccines are pieces of 
messenger RNA, um, which our cells normally use to make proteins, um, but in this case, we've actually synthetically manufactured these um, pieces of RNA, surrounded by a little bit of a lipid coat, a little fatty coat. And so these vaccine particles, when, the, when we inject them into our bodies, they fuse with our cells and our cells then use the mRNA, this little piece of this molecule to make the spike protein, basically a, a protein that's on the surface of the coronavirus, but just the spike protein itself um, in our cells. And then that mRNA is actually broken down by our cells a couple of days later. So the vaccines basically are pieces of RNA that our body uses to make proteins and just, the uh, just a piece of the virus, um, the spike protein. Um, our immune system uh, sees this, these spike proteins um, and our immune system is actually a relatively complex whole set of interactions that includes things like B cells and T cells uh, that play a bunch of different roles, which I won't get into in great detail today, um, but I'll actually refer to multiple times because different arms uh, play different roles and are quite uh, helpful, even if one branch of the immune system isn't as effective as another. So our immune system is activated when we, when we see these um, foreign proteins, um, the spike proteins, um, and, uh, and it basically reacts to those and, and forms an immune reaction that I'll talk about a bunch as we go forward. Okay, so um, those are the two vaccines that people are getting uh, injected with right now, but there are four other vaccines with phase three results um, already out there, um, and they're in use in some countries. So there's a, a vaccine that I'll sometimes refer to as the AstraZeneca or Oxford vaccine. There's a vaccine from Russia called Sputnik V, um, and there's two new vaccines that have uh, companies have reported on some of their initial findings, but there's no kind of detailed data yet, although I'll show a little bit of the press release data later in the talk. Those are vaccines from Johnson & Johnson and from a company called Novavax. Um, so the next thing I want to do is give you the details on how we actually evaluate vaccines so that as these new vaccines um, get, uh, become available or, or are reported on and the FDA considers them, if you want to assess them yourself, you can. So um, as you probably know, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, is being evaluated just in a couple weeks by the U.S. Um, and that may be licensed, uh, or not licensed, but basically given emergency use authorization in just a few weeks. So a really key question in addressing um, a vaccine and how well it's doing is what the vaccine is actually aiming to do with their trial. So what is the actual measure of the efficacy? And so I wanna to try to uh, lay something up that's I think not always fully appreciated. So if we get vaccinated, that can reduce severe disease, but not mild disease or infection. The vaccine could actually reduce mild disease and severe disease, that's a possibility. The disease could actually reduce disease and make you less infectious, often by reducing the amount of virus in our bodies. And finally, the, virus, the vaccine could also, in fact, do all of the above. So it could, in fact, reduce severe and mild disease, reduce infection, and reduce infectiousness, all to varying different degrees. And so there's, it's actually possible to have vaccines that do different amounts of, different, of these different measures. And so we want to be careful when we're assessing how effective they are and what we're measuring that effectiveness against. Um, another key detail, of course, is how many doses of the vaccine are required. And that matters a lot for knowing what our supply looks like and how many people we can vaccinate with a given amount of, of doses of the vaccine. Another big question is, is how long is there between the first and second doses, especially if the second dose is required for the vaccine to be very effective? So that's a big question that um, will come up a little bit later. And then finally, um, when assessing the vaccines, we wanna ask um, when uh, post-vaccination was efficacy measured, that will tell us how long we, we really know that that immunity lasts for. Um, we also can ask questions like, when does protection given the vaccine seem to start. I'll show a little bit of data on that. Um, and then I'll actually not show you any data, but I'll tell you that a, a big question is, is how long do, does immunity from vaccination last? And we don't actually know more than just a few months of data worth on that so far, but, um, but that's a big question going forward. Okay, and then finally, um, less important for the individual person, but, much, but quite important for understanding how effective a vaccine can be in the fight against COVID-19 is the logistics of how easy it is to vaccinate, excuse me, how easy it is to store and ship the vaccine. Okay, so um, let's dive into one of these uh, randomized controlled trials for one of these vaccines so you can understand it in detail, and then I'll show you very brief data on the other ones just so you can kind of understand and make some comparisons for yourself. So, um, so this is data from the Moderna or uh, Moderna vaccine, also co-sponsored by the NIH, and, uh, and the kind of big take-home uh, figure that everyone likes to see and look at it because you can understand it relatively quickly are this, is this graph in the left-hand part of this slide. And so what it's showing here is uh, the x-axis is time, and that's days uh, since people were basically put into a placebo group or a vaccinated group. And then the um, y-axis is basically um, recording cases of symptomatic disease. So these are people that got sick and went and got tested, and the test was positive for this virus, for SARS coronavirus. And so what we can see is that over time, those that got the vaccine, which are in blue here, we see a few infections. So they kind of uh, the y-axis is the cumulative kind of amount of infections that rises over time slightly slowly here, but 
the placebo group, the group that got injected with a placebo, so not the vaccine, just a saline solution, the number of cases or infections in that group rises much, much, much more quickly over time. And we can actually compare the amount of infections in the placebo group relative to that in the vaccinated group and get some efficacy estimates. And so let me give you the details of what, what was actually happening in this trial. There were actually about 30,000 people in the trial, about 14,500 were actually vaccinated with two doses about four weeks apart. There were another 14,500 people that were actually given two shots also, but in that shot was actually no vaccine, it was just a saline solution. So that was the placebo group. Um, in this case, they had, uh, a, in, in all vaccine trials, they have a strict definition of what constitutes a case. And in this case, a case was uh, defined as a kind of mild or, or any type of um, COVID-19. So it was basically a positive test by PCR and either two of the following symptoms, so fever, chills, myalgia, headache, and sore throat, or a loss of um, taste or smell, or cough, shortness of breath, or pneumonia. And so basically, you could have a severe case would get counted as a case, or a relatively mild case would also get counted as a case in this case, case definition. Over the next three months, um, they basically measure the number of cases in these two groups, and that's what's shown in this graph that I just explained to you a minute ago. So that's kind of the basis for which the efficacy is estimated. Um, and the actual numbers of cases, even though there were 30,000 people, um, the, this disease, uh, it's infecting, you know, obviously causing millions of infections in the U.S., um, but in this clinical trial with just 30,000 people, the number of actual infections in the two groups total was relatively small. This is actually relatively standard for, this is actually quite standard for vaccine trials. So there were actually a total of 196 cases um, observed by, by this definition, with 185 in the placebo group and only 11 in the vaccinated group. And that's basically what I just showed you before with this very fast rise in the placebo group. That's the 185 case, cases accumulating. And this is the 11 cases accumulating in the placebo group over here. And as you can hopefully do some quick math, um, basically there's 94% fewer infections in the vaccinated group compared to the placebo group. And that's where you get that, that vaccine efficacy estimate that you've seen probably reported in the press of about 95%. And that's what's shown here over here in the highlighted color. Um, in addition to these um, uh, broader definition of cases, which includes both severe and mild cases, they also actually specifically compared just cases of severe disease. And in this trial, there were 30 cases of severe disease and fantastically, amazingly, all 30 cases were in the placebo group. There are actually no severe cases of COVID-19 in the vaccinated group. So that suggests that this vaccine is being not only very effective at stopping symptomatic disease, um, even when it's relatively mild, but also really quite effective in preventing severe disease. And that's fantastic. So that's the details of how one of these randomized controlled trials um, uh, go for estimating the efficacy of a vaccine. This is data for the Moderna or, uh, vaccine. Um, there was a very, very, very similar trial for um, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, that's shown on this slide here. I'm not gonna step through all the details of it because it's extremely similar. It has basically a bunch of people, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people. The case definition was similar. The time span was about the same amount of time. The efficacy was amazingly similar because the two vaccines are actually a very similar technology. They both used pieces of mRNA. The efficacy in this trial was about 95%, but the confidence bounds around that are 90 to 98. And so the, both, the two trials basically have almost identical efficacy. Um, so, so that's the, another kind of data set from uh, this other vaccine. So this is the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine have basically extremely similar um, efficacy, which is fantastic. I wanna dive in and give you a little bit more details and things that we can pull apart from these trials. Um, so the first is, is that in the trials, they actually uh, evaluated not just overall efficacy, but whether the vaccine was similarly effective at preventing disease in different age groups of people, in different ethnicities, and all kinds of sub-comparisons like this. And thankfully, for both of these vaccines, um, they were similarly effective across age groups and ethnicities. So that means that they didn't seem to be preferentially effective for one group over another, which is great. Um, a second thing that came out from these uh, trials, which your eye may have caught on the last two slides, is that even though these are two dose vaccines, the vaccines actually seem to uh, start to be effective after the first shot. So on the upper, on the right hand side of this slide here, I'm showing you a graph, which is the x axis is time in days since the first shot. And the y axis is again the accumulation of cases in the two groups. And so the kind of orange color here is vaccine and blue is placebo. And what you can see is that as the, when the vaccine trial starts, both groups are getting about the same number of cases through time through about day 10 or so. And then after that, they start to diverge and it looks like the placebo group keeps accumulating cases, whereas the vaccine group starts accumulating cases much slower, suggesting that some people in that group are protected from infection, or excuse me, protected from um, symptomatic infection or cases. And so this was very encouraging and people thought, wow, this is amazing. We're actually getting really quite a good effective protection starting somewhere between 10 and 12 days after the first shot. So people said, hey, could we just give one shot? 
And so this started a huge discussion among scientists. And the challenge was, is that although this, these trials, both the trials, both for Pfizer and Moderna suggested that there was actually quite substantial protection after the first shot, starting about 10 to 12 days afterwards, we don't know from either of the trials how long this protection might last. In both trials, we gave a second shot three to four weeks later, and we know from some previous studies that that second shot is really effective at giving you your immune system a big boost, and I'll show you some data for that later. So, um, so what it means is that um, while uh, the first dot shot does seem to give us some protection, we're, we definitely want to get a second shot, and, uh, and we know we get a much stronger immune system after that second shot. However, there are some questions about how long we can have of a delay between the two doses and still have the um, first shot be as effective as it can be, and maybe even slightly higher efficacy for a second shot with a slightly longer delay. So there's a bunch of speculation and details there that you can ask me about in the um, Q&A after the talk. But I will tell you that the CDC, um, given uh, these findings and these data, has suggested that while we should, if we can, as much as possible, um, use a three to four week delay as we studied in the clinical trials for these two vaccines. If the gap is a little bit longer, like let's say six weeks, um, then that's okay under certain circumstances. So the benefit of doing so is that of course, if we give people shots today and then wait, let's say six weeks instead of four weeks, then we can basically vaccinate some extra people that we protected for two extra weeks. So that's the reason why there's been a whole discussion about this. And if people are interested in the Q&A, we can discuss that topic further. I will tell you that the UK for these same vaccines have, have actually decided it's okay to have actually a 12 week gap between the first and second shots so that they can vaccinate even more people. So um, that decision has been made with not great uh, basis for the data, but they've done it because they feel like the trade-offs are, are worth it. So we can talk about that later more if people are interested. Um, uh, in addition to considering different gaps between the two shots, um, people are also exploring the possibility of using a half dose instead of a full dose. So we'll have twice as much vaccine and could vaccinate twice as many people. There's some data that we're trying to evaluate how effective that might be right now as well. Okay, so the second big um, aspect of these vaccine trials are vaccine safety. And it's basically the big question is, is will the vaccine be better than getting the disease itself? And so um, the vaccine trials, um, all the ones that have been done so far are actually based on a really quite large group of people. So the Moderna trial and the, and the excuse me, the Pfizer trial, both included between 15 and 22,000 people that got the vaccine, plus an equal number that actually got the placebo. So that's actually a quite large group of people to compare uh, to assess efficacy. Um, and they monitored people for at least two months and sometimes um, substantially longer periods of time. And you might ask, why two months? And should we, should we be worried about the fact that we only have two months of data? And the answer is, is that in past vaccine trials, if there were severe side effects, those actually um, arose or were observed in the first two months of the trials. So even though we'd like to have, let's say six months or even a year or two worth of safety data, um, in past vaccine trials, the severe side effects that did arise appeared early on, so we're relatively confident that if we hadn't seen them so far, we're in good shape. So, so far with these vaccines, the most serious side effects that people have seen, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard about in the news, are some allergic reactions to the vaccine. Um, they actually have occurred relatively rarely, which is fantastic. There's been a total of 66 so far out of 17 million people vaccinated, and so the, the kind of odds of that occurring are about 4.7 or 2.5 per million people vaccinated for the two different vaccines. Um, and that's actually relatively low. And as you probably also know, uh, most of those people, about three quarters of them, were people that had a history of allergic reaction. The good news, of course, on top of that being a relatively rare side effect, is that all the people that had the side effect recovered, um, and most of them just got a shot of a, from an EpiPen, basically, to, a, to a, uh, address that allergic reaction um, and were relatively fine. So, um, so the safety overall has been great so far. That's not to say that there's no side effects at all. So what this graph on the right-hand side, which I'm not going to go through the great details on, but um, as expected, uh, this vaccine is actually getting your body to mount an immune response as if you're infected with some sort of virus, right? You're infected with a part of a virus, not the virus itself, but your body doesn't know that initially. And so your body mounts an immune response that, that leads to some side effects. Thankfully, they're all um, quite minor. They're things like pain at the injection site, fatigue, headache, um, and they generally last between one and two days. And so these side effects are much, much, much milder than the disease itself. So, so far, these vaccines, um, uh, all the data we have suggests they're, they're quite safe. Um, I want to make one big point that's happening uh, that, the, that you might see stories in the news. This is really quite important. The first is, is that if we do see an event um, occurring in someone that was vaccinated, we need to compare the odds of that event occurring in, in, let's say, the vaccinated group to the placebo group, because if we don't, we can get some really crazy things. So uh, a scientist actually at University of California, San Francisco, um, right when we were first rolling out the vaccines, had the prescience to, to recognize some things that might occur. And he made a, a really simple slide that he said, if we vaccinate 10 million people, if the vaccine actually has no effect whatsoever, we know from just following people through time 
that about 4,000 of those 10 million people over the next two months will have a heart attack, 4,000 will have a stroke, 14,000 of them will die, and this is just the kind of normal course of the population. And so we know that if, if we vaccinate 10 million people, some of them will have these things happen to them, obviously having nothing to do with the vaccine, and we have to differentiate whether it was the vaccine or something else that caused any of these possible illnesses. So that's a really key take-home thing to ask yourself, is if you see a news report about something happening to a person that got vaccinated, is to ask, what's the likelihood that it actually happened from the vaccine or not? And I will tell you that there's actually a, a giant body of people whose job it is to assess anytime there's a a possible bad side effect in a person that was vaccinated to assess the possibility that the vaccine caused that versus it was caused by something else. Okay, so, um, so I'm trying to tell you some, something about vaccines. We have a limited vaccine supply right now, but it's thankfully growing. You might ask, why are we targeting 65 plus people for, for vaccination? And so I wanna to try to give you a tiny bit of detail on that. So the first super simple answer is that in the US over the last uh, year or so now, 81% of all deaths have actually occurred in people 65 um, years and older. And that's just the kind of raw data so far. I can actually give you more detail on that um, uh, kind of a richer uh, explanation for this. So this graph on the lower left-hand part of this slide here shows the, the chance of death given infection, given your age. So the x-axis is how old you are. And the y-axis is the chance that you will die given that you get infected with this virus, showing you data from a bunch of different really careful studies from a bunch of different places across the world, including New York City, um, Spain, France, uh, England, uh, Switzerland, and so on. And if we look at all these data together, we can actually assess the rough chance of dying given infection. And it turns out it shows a relatively clean linear relationship on a log scale, which means that for every 20 years of age that you increase, your chance of dying increases about tenfold. So for example, if you're 85, your chance of dying is about 10%. If you're 20 years younger, it's about 1%. If you're 20 years younger than that, it's a tenth of that, or about 0.1%, and so on. I will tell you that all these numbers here are about 10 times more deadly than the flu, just to kind of give it some kind of a scope or perspective. So the reason that we're vaccinating people that are 65 years and older is first, because we know that, uh, that just all the deaths in the past year, about 81% have been in people older, older, older than 65, and we have really good data now to actually precisely estimate the chance of death given your age. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that if we just vaccinate everyone over 65, that by itself won't be enough to lift restrictions. And the reason for that is what I'm going to show you on the following slide. So if we look at the age of um, hospitalizations over the last year, that's what's shown on this slide here. It's data from the CDC. It turns out that people over 65 represent actually only less than half of all hospitalizations. So even though they're actually 80% of all the deaths, because the size of the population is much larger that are younger than 65, um, the fraction of all hospitalizations is st still quite large in people that are under 65. So we can't just let the virus spread through all people that are, say, zero to 64 years old. We'll have an enormous number of um, hospitalizations and infections. And as people are probably aware, um, a, a significant fraction of people that are infected um, have chronic symptoms that have been called long COVID. Okay, so another big question I think that comes up a lot is whether it's uh, best for us to preferentially target people that are older or should we be targeting people that are actually, excuse me, that are older and more likely to die if they get infected and more likely to get severe disease, or should we be targeting those that are more likely to get infected in the first place? And the answer is ideally you would do both, but uh, the latter is a little bit difficult. So I wanna explain that to you in just with a couple examples here. So first, um, the, as you guys probably all know, our first set of people to uh, get the vaccine were a combination of the oldest people and healthcare professionals. The reason why we vaccinated healthcare professionals is because their chance of getting sick um, getting infected and getting sick from COVID-19 is much, much higher than any other profession on the planet because, of course, they work with sick people that have COVID all day. And so this um, table on the right-hand side of this slide here just shows the chance of people getting severe COVID-19 by profession um, uh, for not even, excuse me, just including people that are younger than 65. So this is basically um, less than 65-year-old people of different professions. And healthcare workers are basically six to eight times more likely to get severe COVID-19 than non-essential workers and other groups like social care workers, um, food workers, and so on, had slightly elevated risks of severe infection, um, but not nearly as high as healthcare workers. So that's why we targeted that group first. Um, in addition, it's rel it was relatively uh, not trivial, but, but possible for us to assess whether someone was a healthcare worker or not. They could show their badge at the place that they worked. Much more challenging, it turns out, is that if you wanted to try to allocate vaccinations based on profession, and you wanted to target certain groups, it actually might be kind of hard to, uh, to know whether someone was a member of that group or not. So for example, how would you verify that someone was 
uh, undocumented, or it's not undocumented, but how would you verify someone was a farm worker? There often aren't badges that go along with, say, the place that they might work. The same thing for, let's say, a grocery clerk or restaurant cook, uh, you know, kind of getting them to try to prove that they're one of those professions could be somewhat challenging. So it's not that it's impossible to do this, but it's, uh, it's more challenging for sure than some other professions. One of the things that some places are doing and that we're trying to do in Santa Cruz County to try to get the vaccines to the places where um, people have been most exposed to this disease are to try to target, excuse me, target vaccination priority registration to um, uh, parts of our county, for example, that have been hardest hit. So we basically used zip code based vaccination priority registration. That's one possibility. Another thing that we're trying to do here in Santa Cruz County are basically um, form collaborations between the County Department of Health and some of the uh, farms or agricultural um, uh, businesses or companies to try to get farm workers um, vaccinated. So these are some ways that we can try to get around some of these challenges of really getting the vaccines to the people that are most at risk. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom back a little bit and say, okay, we have these vaccines, which is great. And at the same time, actually, we have uh, in the US at least, and actually in other parts of the world as well, the number of COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations and deaths are actually uh, decreasing and in some places decreasing very fast. So on the upper right-hand part of this slide, I've shown the number of cases for California, which are showing a really nice fast decline. On the bottom right are cases um, for all the different continents of which several of them are showing uh, big declines, which is fantastic. So there's a question, of course, why is that occurring? And people can ask me that in the Q&A at the end. Um, but the obvious question that comes up is, are we past the worst of this pandemic? Is it kind of gonna get better from here or is it possible things will happen, get worse in the future? And of course, the answer to that question is the second part of the talk, which is all about these SARS coronavirus 2 variants. And so um, I think probably, I bet everyone in the audience has heard this term before, at least kind of heard it in the news here and there. And I wanna try to unpack some of what we mean by this and what we really know and how we can understand new information as it comes forward. So I'm gonna try to address questions like, what are SARS-CoV-2 variants? Why should we worry about them? And how worried should we be about them? So let's start off with what the heck it is, uh, what is a SARS-CoV-2 variant? So uh, a variant is simply a version of a virus with a set of changes or mutations in its RNA um, that make it different from the original SARS coronavirus 2 virus. So basically, if you look back at the virus when we first uh, detected it and kind of sequenced its RNA from China, and then we compare that to any of the viruses that we see after that, if it has some changes in its RNA, then we say it's different than that original one. So you might ask, okay, but then what's the difference between a variant and a strain? So there's a bunch of different words people use um, for, uh, for viruses and groups of viruses. And the difference between a variant and a strain is basically one is, is along a gradient. So variants are basically any two viruses that are basically different in their, um, their RNA sequences. And strains are thought, we often use the word strain to distinguish things that are substantially different between um, two different types of the virus. And so there's a little bit of gray area there and some scientists will actually disagree about how many, whether something should be considered a different strain or not. And I won't get into that detail here today, um, but I just wanted to, uh, let you guys know that that's why you're hearing some different words being used for different things. Okay, so then in, the big question is, is what are, where do these names come from for the variants? And I'll tell you that there's an effort, a substantial effort right now by many groups to try to get away with place-based names. So you've probably heard of things like the UK variant or the South Africa variant or the Brazil variant. And the reason why we're trying to get away from place-based names is two reasons. One is, is that that's usually just the first place the virus was detected or that variant was detected it may or may not actually have a rose in that place. So for example, the South Africa variant was first detected in South Africa, but later sequencing or later analysis of viruses have actually found that virus earlier in other places. So it didn't actually, may or may not have arisen there first. So that's a good reason not to name it based on a place. The second reason is that it can create stigma for that place. So people can blame that location for that virus arising there. And I think most people probably have heard of examples of that in the past. So we're trying to get away from that. The challenge is, is that then you ask, okay, how do we name things? So one possibility um, is that people have suggested a way to name viruses based on what part of the branch of the phylogenetic tree or evolutionary tree that virus variant is on. So the, the picture on the right-hand side of this um, slide is basically a evolutionary tree representing different versions of the virus over time. And you can say, okay, we could name this group of viruses, let's say here in this branch of the tree and give that a name. And in fact, that's actually what's been done. So that's great. But the names that have come out of this naming scheme um, which are quite useful for science, are quite difficult for, I think, the public and people to kind of uh, uh, remember and think about. So, for example, uh, the same viruses that I just referred to up here by the, by the uh, geographic names where they were first detected have names like B117, B1351, and so on. And, of course, 
uh, I don't know about you guys, but it's hard for my brain to really keep those names in there. Um, it turns out some there's been other naming schemes as well for these variants. Um, sometimes the variant name has been based on single mutations. So basically mutations that have occurred in individual amino acids um, uh, for the virus. So one of those is, for example, D614G that many of you have heard about in the news last year. Um, there's some new viruses. There's a new one that people are kind of naming by this mutation here. Um, there was a few variants that had a mutation in amino, uh, amino acid 501, and they were given names like 501Y-V1 and dash V2 and so on. Um, going forward, there's some suggestions of maybe uh, naming viruses based on clusters of mutations. So instead of one mutation, how about multiple mutations at once? Um, so that's a possibility as well. Um, there's challenges in that uh, sometimes viruses in different places that are on different branches of the evolutionary tree can basically uh, have the same mutation arise. And so then you actually have what we call convergent evolution, where the same mutation arises in two different branches of the evolutionary tree um, just by chance and then spreads possibly due to th that mutation conferring some selective advantage. Um, so, so these are some, some of the challenges. And what I want to just say completely openly is that if this is challenging and confusing to you, you're not alone. So we know why place-based names are problematic. We know that this kind of branch naming scheme um, has some advantages and is, is good in some ways, but it's hard for us to kind of keep these numbers and things in our head. Um, also, I'll just mention briefly that, that what really matters the most is not so much what branch of the tree you're on, but what actual mutations, what actual, yeah, mutations you actually have in the virus itself. So we'd actually prefer this for some reasons, but then of course, due to the things I said about um, convergent evolution occurring and, and some other possibilities, not knowing exactly which mutations matter the most, even mutation-based names can be challenging. So, um, so there hasn't been a super great solution uh, for coming up with names that are easy for us to remember, and uh, so they and they also kind of confer the information we want to confer, and does don't kind of create stigma or, or place blame on the places where they're first detected. Um, so yeah. So anyway, that's that's how the naming works. All right. So let's dive into these actual variants themselves, um, and uh, and let me just give you a few. And so uh, so last year in 2020 was the first variant that people really started to think a lot about. That was that was something called D614G. Um, and, uh, and that actually sp spread globally in 2020. So that virus is actually everywhere. Now there's, there's, uh, there are a few of the old variants around, but that one's the kind of predominant strain. Um, a virus variant that we've heard a lot about recently, and I'll talk actually quite a bit about in a minute, um, is this var variant that was first detected in the UK. It has this name B117. Um, it's also been given this other name here, 501YV1, and that was first detected in the UK. Um, uh, there's some more that people have heard of, as I said, the South Africa variant. Um, there's been a, vi a various, excuse me, virus variant detected in Brazil that also has a name on this naming scheme. There's a recent one that was detected in California and it's been now found in a few places. Um, just in the past week or so, there's a new uh, kind of virus variant that was detected in two different states and now appears to be in a bunch of different places um, that involves uh, mutations at this uh, kind of additional amino acid position. And so if you're slightly bewildered by this list here and you're thinking, oh my God, how am I gonna keep this straight? The answer is it's actually far worse than this. There's going to be new versions of this virus popping up all the time, and so um, so that's going to be challenging. And, and it's be our goal is to assess what's the real impact or importance of these different variants. And I'm going to talk about that next. I'll say one last thing here about the ones that are out there so far that we've been talking about. That is that people have cataloged the different mutations that occur in these different variants and which ones are shared between these different variants. And there's a few that are quite important that appear to have really functional significance. Um, and because of that, people have started to uh, kind of hone in on those name. Excuse me, on those uh, yeah, on those mutations and giving them kind of uh, funny or cute names to help remember them. So for example, this 501 um, amino acid position here variant that where some, a change from an N to a Y, people have called that Nelly. Um, another one that's actually quite important is this E484K mutation um, that people have called Eek and so on. So people's, this, these are people's attempts to try to give things names that are a little bit easier for our brains to understand. Okay, so, um, so now let's think about when we think about a variant arising, we want to ask what makes something a variant we should care about. And one of the names that um, has been used in the UK quite a bit is a variant of concern. So the reason that we first start worrying about a variant is usually when we see something increasing in frequency. So on the right graph of this slide here um, is the fraction of, uh, of positive samples from people that tested positive for COVID-19 um, COVID that were belong to a certain uh, variant group. So had a certain kind of set of mutations. Um, and that basically shows this increasing over time in the US as a whole, in Florida and California. And so people said, oh, you know, this virus is increasing in frequency. Might that mean it has some, uh, it's different than the old virus. It has some traits that we should think of, we should worry about. 
So that's just one type of data that we see frequently is an increase in frequency over time. So that's uh, one variant down here. There's some similar data for California down here, which represents um, a rise in this other variant that's sometimes been called Cal 20C. It has a few other names as well. I won't kind of bore you with the names, but basically the same thing. It's this pink color down here. It was basically not found uh, very often at all in the early months, and then basically popped up and started to increase in frequency over the next couple months here. So we see a virus variant increasing in frequency. We then ask things like, is this virus more transmissible? Is that why it's increasing in frequency? Is this virus more deadly? And can this virus actually infect people that had immunity from a previous um, infection or from vaccination? So these are the three big questions we often ask about each variant is, are they functionally different than the virus that we had before that? So, um, so I'm gonna show you the, I'm gonna talk about the virus variant that we know the most about and the kinds of evidence we've used to try to assess whether it's functionally different than other, um, other forms of the virus. So uh, this variant that was first detected in the UK, it has this name B117. Um, we actually have quite a bit of data now that we tried to assess to ask, why did this virus increase in frequency? And do we really believe that this virus is different than the old virus? So the, the lines of evidence that we think now indicate this virus does have functional differences from the other viruses that were out there before that include the following things. So the first thing is that this virus, it increased in frequency, not just in one place, which could have been due to just chance, but it actually increased in frequency in a bunch of different places, um, either totally independently or semi-independently. So for example, the upper uh, right, the graph on the upper right corner of this slide here shows the increase in frequency of this variant in a bunch of different parts um, of the United Kingdom. So it basically rose from very low levels to very high levels over and over and over again. And the odds of that happening simply due to chance is quite low, especially because some of these places don't have a huge amounts of travelers going back and forth between them. This variant has also increased in frequency in a bunch of other places that aren't really, that aren't part of the same country and therefore aren't that connected with this place. So for example, here's data on the lower right for Toronto showing basically a nice, uh, quite stark increase as well over time. There's, I'm not gonna bore you with the data, but there's actually data like this now for this variant from uh, just uh, dozens of places. So there's been really nice data collected from Switzerland, Ireland, I just showed you the Toronto data, there's California data, Florida data, and so on. So, um, so that first bit of data is if the virus increases in frequency, not just in one place, but in multiple places, that suggests it's less likely to be, be due to chance and the virus may actually be able to be, it must be slightly better than the other viruses that are there if it's increasing in frequency over time. So that's, um, that's the first line of evidence. The second thing that was looked at for this virus was, was to ask how was it spreading more than the other viruses that were there? Was it, were people more infectious because they had more virus in them? And so, uh, so there was actually several analyses to try to actually simply go and look and say, how much virus was there in people that had this new variant versus the old kind of the virus? And an early paper suggested that these people may actually have more virus in them um, than the original strain. So, so that was initially suggestive, suggesting that maybe this virus is doing better because it replicates better in our body and we get more amounts of virus and we therefore are more infectious. However, we have to be careful about those kinds of analyses because it turns out that as the epidemic waxes and wanes, um, just the way that when we, the, the timing at which people come and get tested for the um, virus can, can itself change the amount of virus that we see in their body. And if you don't believe me, I wanna show you some hard data on that. So, um, so this graph on the right-hand side of this slide here the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is actually the amount of virus in swabs from people that tested positive for the coronavirus over time in, it looks like, about nine different parts um, of, of England. And what these data show is that as the number of cases rises and falls, the, uh, the actual amount of virus on each swab of people that are testing positive varies over time as well. And if people want to try to understand that in more detail, you can ask me in the Q&A, but the take-home message is, is that it's actually quite difficult, and we have to be, actually be quite careful in comparing amounts of virus between a variant and say the old virus, we have to correct for, be careful about um, uh, changes in, uh, in over time. And so we can actually get different amounts of viruses on swabs over time due to factors that have nothing to do with the actual virus itself. So it turns out that there's now good evidence from a new paper that suggested that in fact, there's no difference in the amount of virus in people with this variant as with the old variant, which means that we don't quite yet know why people are actually more infectious for this variant um, than they were for the old types of the virus. So, so that's the second kind of evidence that we, we tried to assess. We had an initial idea, but then when we had a larger data set and analyzed it more carefully, we found that there was not support for that, um, uh, that, that reason for this virus doing better. The next line of evidence that we actually have for this variant that's actually quite convincing is what are called secondary attack rates that come from contact tracing studies. So the idea here is that um, if you have a set of people 
that you that are that are infected, and we find out who they had contact with. And we then test the people that they had contact with and measure the fraction of those people that go on to become infected. That's actually a measure of how infectious that case was in the first place. And so that's actually been done in the UK with about 50,000 people. Um, so we, we knew the infection, the case that they were exposed to, and then we could then go on to measure what fraction of them went on to become infected after having had contact with a person that either had this new variant, B117, or the old kind of virus. And what you can hopefully see on this graph here the x-axis is age, the y-axis is the fraction of a given case's contacts that became infected, and the um, blue bars are this new variant, and the old type of virus is the orange bars. And what you can see is that for all age groups from zero to nine all the way up to the 80 plusers, the, those people that were infected with the B117 variant actually infected more of their contacts with the virus. And so this was evidence that this virus actually is again more infectious. So this is kind of an independent line of evidence besides this variant increasing in frequency over time that tells us, yes, this virus is actually functionally different than the old virus. And you can actually analyze how much better it is from this, um, from this data set here. And so basically on average, people that were infected with this new variant infected about 13% of their contacts versus those that had the old kind of the virus being somewhere around about 10%. And so it's about 35% higher. <laughs> Okay, so a, a second question that I mentioned a minute ago was, if, this, if a new variant pops up, we also might wanna ask, is this new variant more or less deadly? It could evolve to be more deadly, it could evolve to be less deadly, and of course we'd prefer the latter. So we wanted to try to assess this. There were early reports that suggested there was not that much difference between uh, this new variant and the old variant and how deadly it was, but we didn't have that much data. As more and more data has accumulated over the past two months, the unfortunate answer is yes, and I'm gonna show you some of that data here. Um, I'm gonna show you one set of analyses, but there's actually a whole set of additional analyses by independent groups all assessing this question. Um, then the overall weight of the evidence suggests that it's likely that it is more deadly. So, uh, so here's one of the analyses. Um, the x-axis is time since the person tested positive for either um, this new variant or the old variant. The y-axis is the fraction of people that are still alive. And so what you can hopefully see with your eye is that um, after people test positive, some fraction of them die. And the, those, the, the people that were infected with this new variant in red here, a, a higher fraction of them basically die or a lower fraction survive over time. And the differences appear to kind of become apparent somewhere about 10 to 15 days after, um, after they test positive. Um, this analysis uh, analyzed whether this difference was due to differences among individual age groups. So did this new variant was especially more deadly in some groups than other ones. And it, it appeared that the difference in severity was uh, uh, occurred across all age groups. Um, and so I wanna just try to illustrate one or two of these um, comparisons for you. So on average, it looks like it's about 30 to 70% uh, more deadly, but it doesn't mean that you have a say 50% chance of dying. It means that the risk of dying has gone up by that percent. So for example, if you are a woman between the ages of 70 and 84, the old virus had about a 2.9% chance, given that you were detected as a case of going on to die, whereas with this new variant, that's now about 4.5%. So basically it's gone from three to about 4.5%, which is about a 50% increase. Similarly, if you're a man um, of the same age, it went from about 4.5% or 4.7% to about 7.5%. So that's the 50% increase that I'm talking about here. Okay, um, so that's a ton of information about this one variant, first and second in the UK called B117. Um, and there's a bunch of other variants out there and you might wanna know what about the other variants, what are they like? And so um, the other variant that we know the most about is this one first detected in South Africa that's been called B1351 or 501YB2. Um, this variant, like other ones, increased in frequency and we have some data now um, on, on par part of the reason why. So, um, so what I'm showing you in this graph here are uh, data that's uh, where we basically take blood from people and we try to see whether that blood that people that people have, either from initial infection or from vaccination, and I'm going to show you data on vaccination in a minute, but this is data from blood from people that was previously infected with this virus and recovered. We then ask, can their blood neutralize this virus? And can they neutralize one kind of the virus or a diff or new variant kind of the virus? And so what this is what I'm comparing here in this graph is basically how strong our, our, um, our blood's ability was to neutralize the virus, either the original virus here on the left or this new South African variant B1351 here on the right. And what you hopefully can very simply see with your eye is that all these lines go down 
And so basically this virus is not as well neutralized by um, the kind of antibodies in the blood of people that have been previously exposed. So this virus is able to partially escape the immune kind of response of people, at least a single part of it, which is their antibody response. And so, um, so this is one set of data that people have used to try to assess, is the virus becoming able to infect people that have been previously infected before? So let me say two things. The first is, is that a subset of these people, actually about 48%, their blood could neutralize the virus before, but in this study, excuse me, could neutralize the original form of the virus, but actually could not neutralize at all the, the new kind of variant form of this virus. So about half of them. So this is a, a paper that, uh, excuse me, that was a preprint. So it's not been peer reviewed, but it's been uh, posted to a website, um, suggests that this virus is actually able to uh, not be neutralized by antibodies from people that have been previously exposed. So that's worrisome, but it's really important for me to say that antibodies are not our only way that we fight off this virus. And so uh, scientists believe that even though people that um, had been previously exposed their antibodies can no longer, about half the people can no longer neutralize this virus. They still have an immune response that would actually still prevent them from being as sick as they would have been otherwise. Um, and a key part of that are their T cells. Okay, so this is um, one kind of data that you will see reported in the press a bunch. And that's why I wanted to show you an example of it. And I'll show you one more example in a minute um, of where we try to assess, are these new variants able to escape our immune response that we amounted to a previous form of the virus or to vaccination? Um, and, and this data I'm showing you on this slide here suggests that one of the variants actually has uh, evolved or mutated to be able to partly escape the immune response of some people um, in a way that um, will probably lead to them having a higher chance of being infected, but their chance of illness is not super clear from this kind of data. We don't really know that quite so well yet. So I'll show you additional data on that in a second. Um, there's also data from another variant um, that's been called P1 or 501YV3, first detected in Brazil, that shows similar patterns to this, although not quite as strong. And I'm gonna show you data on that in a second. Um, there are other variants um, that you've heard about, the one in California. Um, that one, we have data that's increasing in frequency, but we actually know almost nothing else about it in terms of its um, differences functionally from other kinds of the virus. Um, there's this new variant that was reported in the New York Times, I think it was just last week. And again, this virus is increasing in frequency, this variant, but we don't really know how it differs in terms of a functional way um, from other viruses. Okay, so I think the next big obvious question um, uh, is what about the vaccines? Do they protect us against these new variants? And so the, the answer to this is a qualified yes, but for some variants, not as well as the original virus. There's a bunch of data and I'm just gonna show you one example of it, um, but then kind of summarize the rest. So um, there's a ton of data on what I just showed you a minute ago, which is on antibody neutralization, which is to say, do antibodies that we make from either previous exposure or vaccination, can they neutralize the virus? There's a little bit of data actually on how well that protects you against actual disease, and that comes from these vaccine trials. Um, unfortunately, those data are, have not been shared in kind of full scientific form yet. They've just been reported by the companies that did the vaccine trials in their press releases. So I'll show that in a second. So the first part is this one study I'm going to show you because it's the most uh, comprehensive, but there's actually a ton of data um, a bunch of other papers that look just like this. And what they're basically trying to do is compare if someone got vaccinated with a given vaccine, the data I'm showing you here are the Pfizer vaccine. They then compare the ability of um, the antibodies in the blood of that person to neutralize different kinds of this virus. Um, and so for example, um, the, and this graph actually shows how good their people's blood is to neutralize the virus after one or two doses. Um, so let me just teach you how to read this slide. So the x-axis are different kinds of the virus. So the original type that first came from China, that we detected from China is this far left one here. The mutation that spread across all of the US last year, this D614G, which some people have called Doug, that one is the next virus here. The next one is the one I just spent a ton of time talking about first detected in the UK, B117. Then the ones um, from uh, South Africa that I just showed you quite a bit of data on also, that's this one here. And then these two that were detected first in Brazil, P1 and P2 are also um, share some mutations with that one as well here. I'm sorry, I just, I made a mistake. The ones that are from South Africa are actually these ones over here. Um, and uh, this is B1429, that's the one that was detected in California, sorry. So these are the ones from South Africa here that are the B1351s and three different versions of that virus. So the big take home that I want to uh, give you from this slide, which summarizes this study, but is actually consistent with about a dozen other studies just like this, suggests that if you get vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine, you mount a very strong immune response well, let me just show you the two patterns. The first is with the first dose, 
you get a decent immune response. When you get your second dose, you get an even stronger immune response, much, much stronger. And in fact, this um, y-axis here is on a log scale. So the mean of all these kind of points here is somewhere around, let's say, uh, 10 to the, a little bit higher than 10 to 2. If you get up in here, you're tenfold higher. So you basically get a tenfold higher neutralization after your second dose. So the second doses are important, and that's good. Your immune response against that first variant we saw last year, the D614G, basically you're just as good. So there's no real difference between these two groups. So this variant of the virus, um, although it appeared to be slightly more infectious, it didn't appear to basically evade our immune systems at all. So our immunity from this vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, and, and most likely the Moderna vaccine, because they're so similar, are equally effective between these two various excuse me, virus variants. Um, the UK variant, this B117 that I've talked about, it also appears to be pretty much equally effective against that variant as well, which is fantastic. So even though this variant appears to be substantially more infectious, about 30 to 50% more infectious, and appears to be a bit more deadly, um, this virus variant here, our immune response from this vaccine seems to be quite, quite effective and no more or less effective than against the original wild type virus. So that's fantastic news. Um, so that's really good. Um, the other virus variants that are out there, the ones P1 and P2 from first detected in Brazil and those detected in South Africa, our, um, our antibody response and our ability to neutralize those viruses is not as good as it was against the original type viruses or this uh, B117 variant here. So as I said before, and this is just further data reinforcing that um, previous point, that these viruses, virus variants, have evolved some ability to partly evade our immune response. And so that's what you're seeing here, where basically the immune response, the neutralization is lower for this, these variants here, these kind of variants first detected in South Africa, that's what the SA up here stands for, than, um, than against the original wild type viruses, which is over here. Um, and so that's evidence that the virus is basically trying to evade the immune response of people that have been previously exposed or vaccinated, which are, are similar. Okay, so that's what I said there already on the slide. Um, and I already made the second point, which is that the second dose is really, really important in getting us to have our maximal immune response. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say about that. So the summary from this slide is that um, that our antibody response against uh, once we get vaccinated with either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine is is great. We know how efficacious it was. I showed you data on that the first part of the talk, and we know that against these other variants, it's still extremely effective against this variant, and um, still substantially better than not having any vaccine at all, but not quite as effective, at least at neutralizing the virus, this one kind of measure um, against these other variants um, that have been detected in other parts of the world. Okay, so what about actual efficacy in, in symptomatic infection? Does the vaccination still protect us against actual disease? It turns out we don't have good data on this yet for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, but we have it for some other vaccines because they actually did trials by chance in South Africa where this is actually occurring and in South America. So we don't have detailed data yet. These are just press releases from the company so far, but they still give us some hints of an answer. So there was a, a, I'll give you the worst news first and it'll get better after that. So the AstraZeneca or Oxford vaccine, that was, they did a small trial in South Africa with a really small number of people. So it's only 2000 people, which is quite small, but when they compared the efficacy of that, of their vaccination before this new variant popped up. So last year, kind of previous to uh, November, their vaccine was quite good. But then after this new variant arose, the vaccine became almost completely not effective um, in protecting against uh, mild symptomatic COVID-19. So that's, that's not good. Um, thankfully, other vaccines that have also been done in South Africa appear to be more effective than the Oxford vaccine against that variant. So the Novavax, which is a company that's released some initial data, but no detailed scientific papers yet, suggested that when they ran a vaccine trial in the UK, um, it was extremely effective, the same as the kind of Pfizer Moderna vaccines against the original virus. It was a smidgen less, but not, but still quite high against this kind of new, new UK variant. I've talked about a bunch today. Um, in South Africa, it was not as good, but still was decent. So it still provided 60% efficacy against reducing symptomatic illness in HIV negative people and about 50% that in a group that included some HIV people. Um, the interesting part about this study was it showed that um, in their study, people that had previously been exposed to the old virus had very poor protection against infection with this new virus, but those that were vaccinated actually did quite well. So what this tells us, which there's actually a bunch of evidence, including this here, but, but from other studies, that the vaccines actually provide a stronger immune response than normal infection, which is fantastic. The final bit of data that we have on this so far is from a press release from Johnson & Johnson, and they ran a trial in the US, in Latin America, and South Africa with a single dose vaccine. So it's a different vaccine than these other ones, which are all two doses, 
but their data suggested that in the US, their single dose vaccine was about 72% effective in preventing moderate and severe disease. So a different endpoint than the other ones, which included mild disease as well, but that in South Africa, um, the protection was lower. So the vaccine didn't do quite as good, but still did substantially better than the placebo group, right? So it still reduced infection by 57%. So that suggests that at least these two vaccines, um, even though the variants in South Africa evade, partly evade our immune system, the vaccines still are quite effective in reducing disease quite a bit. All right, so it's kind of summarizing this last part and I just have a couple more slides um, to finish up the talk. So all this together suggests that some of these variants are more transmissible and it looks like one of them is slightly more fatal. Um, and if they are more, more transmissible, this will require either higher immunity or more restrictions to keep the pathogen from spreading. So they keep the number of cases per case, which is this symbol RT, less than one. Some variants, we now have pretty good evidence, can partially evade the immune response of people and reinfect people and even cause disease in some people that have been previously either vaccinated or um, exposed to the virus. Um, so that's the data I just showed you a minute ago. Um, the extent of escape from our immune systems and the effect on severe disease is not super well known yet. There's a little bit of hints of data here and there, um, but there's still quite a bit of uncertainty. Um, but most scientists believe that there's still gonna be substantial protection, especially against severe disease. Um, a really important point that's arose out of a bunch of studies is that vaccine-derived immunity appears to be superior to infection-derived immunity, especially against these new variants. And that means even if you've been previously exposed, you should still get vaccinated. Um, the, the big take home here that I want to say is that I've talked about a few variants, but there's gonna be a bunch more variants popping up over the next, say, three to six months. Um, and what I've tried to do is give you tools to try to understand what you wanna know about these variants to really understand them better. All right, so a quick aside that um, some people are already making tables of different vaccines and trying to say, which one should I get? Should I get the Johnson & Johnson or the Moderna or the Pfizer or what? So what I wanna say overall is that all the vaccines um, that, that are gonna be licensed for use here in the US and in other countries will provide at least some protection and often very high protection against COVID-19. And, um, and the ones that we're considering here have provided substantial protection against all currently known variants. And so that's fantastic which be, means that all these vaccines will reduce the likelihood of severe disease if you get infected with the virus. So that's good. And because of all this data, I personally will take whatever vaccine is offered to me as soon as it's my turn to get vaccinated. If you, when it becomes your turn to get vaccinated, have a choice, which may happen sometime in the future, I will just tell you to be a little bit careful in comparing the vaccines because the trials differ in what they've measured against how they measure their efficacy. And if you don't make a careful comparison, you might actually uh, not necessarily, you might think one's better than the other when they're in fact both equally good. All right, so a couple last points to try to touch on. Um, one is, is if we get vaccinated, should we keep wearing a mask and social distance? And the answer to that is yes. And we should do that not forever, but until first we wanna know a little bit about how long our protection is going to last. So far we know it'll last for at least two to three months, probably much longer, but we don't know, uh, we don't have as good a date on that as we would like. The second thing is we want our friends and family around us to also be vaccinated. And finally, we'd like to have transmission in the community be lower. And so you might say, well, why is that? Why can't the day I get vaccinated or at least a couple of days, maybe a week or two after my second dose, just stop with the mask in the distance? And there's a couple of reasons for that. So first is, is that the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines reduce your chances of symptomatic infection by 95%, which is absolutely fantastic, but it's not 100%. So it'd still be good not to be in that 5% group. In addition, as I mentioned, the vaccines also greatly reduce your chances of severe illness um, a ton, so that's also fantastic. Um, but there is a possibility that you still could get infected and pass on the virus to someone else. So you want you basically want uh, your friends and family around you also to be vaccinated um, before you uh, start not wearing a mask and not social distancing. And so we have some data from one of the trials that suggested that the vaccine reduces asymptomatic infection and symptomatic infection by a bunch, by two thirds, but not 100%. So that just means that if you get exposed after you get, get vaccinated, you could get infected and you could be the 5% that still gets sick, or you could be the additional percent that actually still gets infected, but not necessarily sick and pass it on to a friend or family member. So that's why we wanna to try to keep wearing our mask and social distancing until we're, we're vaccinated and then our friends and family around us are vaccinated and the virus in the community is at a lower level. All right, so the end of this is just to ask, what does the future likely hold? When can we go and hug our friends and family? Can, when can we go to dance parties, sporting events, whatever we really kind of wanna do? Um, so the answer to that is basically when we reach herd immunity, and the idea of a herd immunity is really simple. It's just that in the initial state, uh, when everyone in the population is susceptible, so all of these people here in blue, if you put an infected person in that community, then they can spread the virus to all the people around them. 
And so that obviously leads to rapid spread, which we saw over the past year. As the population becomes immune, either by infection or vaccination, more and more people become immune. That's these yellow people here. And the infected people bump into fewer and fewer susceptible people and the virus can't spread as much. So that's this bottom slide here at the bottom. And we can actually calculate numbers for that for a given virus by knowing some things about how well it spreads. Um, yeah, so here's my quick um, predictions for the next uh, few months. So in the next one to three months, there's a race. The good news is that cases are currently falling in many countries. Um, that's partly due to a, a buildup of immunity from people being exposed in the last few months from social distancing measures and increasingly from vaccines. We now have five safe and effective vaccines, two of which we have uh, are using in the US with several more on the way, that's the good news. The bad news, which I give you a bunch of details about is that there's several virus variants spreading, including viruses that are more infectious that require higher interventions or stronger immunity to keep the virus from spreading. And, um, there's, and one of these variants is actually more deadly as well. There's also variants out there that can infect some fraction of people that have been previously infected or vaccinated and cause some disease in those people. So what we need to do is to vaccinate people as fast as possible and keep transmission low until we do so with masks and distancing and ventilation. In the medium term, there's quite a bit of uncertainty and the big questions are, how well do the vaccines that we have block transmission and infection, not just disease? So that's a big still unknown question. Um, we still also need to know whether the variants that arise can cause disease in people that are vaccinated, can, excuse me, can cause severe disease. We don't think so, but we don't have as good a data as we would like. Finally, how fast can we develop and deploy booster vaccines that actually will block uh, infection and disease from these new variants? So the companies are all already working on this, but uh, we don't really quite know yet how fast we can develop those and get those out to people. In the long term, over the next six and 12 months and longer, um, here's my initial guesses of where we're at. So if I was naively optimistic, or I should say highly optimistic and maybe possibly naive, I would say that it's possible for us to have a global effort to eradicate this virus like a bunch of countries have actually done repeatedly where they get rid of the virus and the traveler brings it back in and they kind of stamp it out again. That would be fantastic. I'm not sure we'll pull that off. More realistically, I think what's gonna happen is that over the next six to 12 months, everyone that wants a vaccine will get one and that these vaccines will greatly reduce severe illness, but probably not stop all infection, especially from some of the new variants that can partially evade our immune system. Unfortunately, at the same time, over the next kind of similar time period, many developing countries will actually not have access to vaccines because most of the rich countries have bought all of the doses up. And that's a real challenge. And as a result of that, the virus will continue being transmitted in these countries and will get new variants popping up. And so there's a saying that's been going around that really captures all this, which is that no one is safe until we're all safe. So we really need to uh, make sure that we have equitable vaccine distribution around the world. Finally, over the kind of much longer term, um, I think we're gonna have vaccines that have annual updates that will limit uh, severe disease in rich countries um, and the vaccines plus some infection in um, when people are younger in developing countries will se limit severe disease there as well. And that's kind of where we're gonna go in the long term going forwards. This will no longer be a, a virus that causes an enormous amount of severe disease. Um, uh, just it'll cause much, much milder disease because we'll be getting vaccinated and some low amounts of infection in some countries. And with that, I'm gonna skip this last slide and go on to questions. I think you're muted, Beth. Muted. Thanks, Marm. Um, I saw that I was muted. A little sign comes up. This is the Zoom life, right? Look, you're talking. Uh, sorry about that. Um, that was a great talk and super informative. And as some people have said in the comments, even makes us feel a little bit better, I think. Some parts of it make us feel better. Some parts of it make us feel a little bit daunted about the next maybe six six months, six to 12 months or so. Um, there are a lot of questions and I've tried to organize them while you've been speaking. So if I ask questions that you have already answered a little bit, well, forgive me, but also it's probably good people are still interested in, in hearing the questions again. Um, we also received a ton of questions before the talk began. So I've integrated those questions with the ones that we've received while you were speaking. I thought that since we have such a huge number of questions, I would start in time. Um, one of the questions actually is about what we know about the origin of the disease. So can you talk a little bit about what we know now about where it came from, how long it's been in people, um, and some of the theories about um, you know, zoonotic transfer and things like this? I can actually, maybe I'll say two words and maybe I'll let you pick up the rest of it because I think actually you might know even more than me, but uh, the evidence we have so far is that 
Um, this virus is relatively close related to some viruses that we, that we have isolated from bats. Um, in fact, it's most closely related kind of evolutionary ancestor. Um, actually, the two closely, most closely related were also from bats, but there's enough differences between those viruses and, and this virus that infects people that we can't say for sure if it came from a bat or it actually passed, let's say, from a bat to another animal and then to, into people. And so, um, so that means that we don't really quite know exactly where it came from yet. Most people, I think, point towards bats as the most likely group, but we don't really know exactly which species. There are a number of scientists that are trying to go and sample a bunch of different kinds of animals and see if we can find a close relative, um, but we really don't have a, a, a kind of smoking gun yet on that one. Can you, would you like to comment more on that? I, that covers it. I, I think it's important also to say that that's not surprising. You know, we, there are a lot of viruses that are circulating in animals that we have contact with that we, then there's going to be a huge amount of diversity in these viruses. We're probably exposed to them all the time. And just because we don't know exactly where it came from, doesn't mean that it didn't come from bats or that it, it that, or that we won't eventually learn it. We might actually never learn it because there are so many viruses that are circulating, but um, yeah. So onto the, the variants that are that are emerging, there are a series of questions that are about the vaccines and the variants, which is not surprising. People are concerned, obviously, that the vaccines that we have aren't going to be um, efficacious against the different variants. You talked a little bit about what we know about the efficacy of the of the variants against the the variant the vaccines against the variants. Can you talk a little bit about the experiments that people do to try to figure this out and um, how quickly these things can move? So as these new variants come up, we, we can learn about whether the vaccines are going to be effective against them? Sure, so, so I tried to show some of that data, but there's some other pieces to that that I didn't have time to and that actually end up being really important. So, um, so the two, I guess the three pieces of that that are most important, the first is to ask, if a new virus variant pops up somewhere, we want to know if you get vaccinated, does that protect you against that variant? Now, what we don't do, um, people propose it, but it's not happened yet, is people actually could do a challenge study where you actually vaccinate someone and actually try to infect them with the virus. So uh, that actually has not started yet, but there are proposals to do that. And there are some places that are um, actually in the UK, there are some proposals to, to do that because that would give you the most quickest answer to, does this vaccine actually protect me against infection? So, um, so so that's, in case people are wondering, why don't they just try that? The answer is people are considering that for sure. However, as you, of course, I'm sure people can um, understand that kind of experiment carries a substantial risk with it. And so, uh, so to voluntarily kind of purposely uh, get infected with this virus is, is a risky measure. So, um, so, so far that's not been a tool that we've used so far, but, but in the future it may be. Instead, the two main ways we've tried to assess whether a variant, whether a, vac a vaccine can protect you against a variant is to one, take blood from people that have been vaccinated and just ask if I mix that in solution with the virus, can, that, can the stuff that's in our blood and, and primarily antibodies, can they actually neutralize or bind to that virus and make it not be able to infect us anymore? And that's the kind of data I showed you a few slides on and that's the easiest and fastest to do. And so as soon as these variants pop up, a dozen labs around the world will instantly do these kinds of studies. If there's a new variant popping up, some will do a study just in the next probably week or two um, with sera, with blood from people that have been vaccinated and ask, can it neutralize that kind of virus? Um, so those studies are relatively easy to do and fast to do on the scale of just days to weeks, and we can get answers relatively quickly. Um, what's more difficult is to ask, okay, that tells us something about how our antibodies can bind to or neutralize the virus, but what about really the chance of us getting sick and how sick we'll get? And that those kinds of questions are much more difficult to answer, and that's why I showed data not for the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine against these new variants, but these ones for these other vaccines because those vaccine trials just happened to occur in these countries where these vaccines arose. And that was the only way we could really get at that kind of answer. So the challenge of that, of course, is that those are these thousands of thousands of people trials that are happening where we're actually relying on a kind of accidental infection or not in the vaccine group and the placebo group with this new kind of variant. I will also say, which I probably should have pointed out briefly before, we have to be a little bit careful in interpreting differences in those vaccine trials between countries to the variants and that there's a few other possible reasons that you could actually get different efficacies in different places, just having to do with uh, people's overall environments that they're living in and the other, other kinds of pathogens they're exposed to. So the data we have, um, for example, comparing the Johnson & Johnson's trials between the countries where it occurred is probably due to the vaccine variants, but it could also be due to some other things as well. So we have to be a little bit careful exactly on assessing that kind of evidence. So I, I don't know if that fully answers that question, Beth, and I'd be happy to 
have you clarify if not? It, it does. Um, what do we know? And I know this is harder to say because the trials were taking place for the other vaccines, the vaccines that people are talking about more, more widely right now before these variants popped up. But what do we know about the efficacy of the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine against the variants so far? So we, what we just know definitively are the kind of data I showed you before, which is, does our antibodies actually neutralize the virus? Those kinds of kind of sera blood virus neutralization tricks. Um, there's some additional analyses, which I, sh I should be super clear about. I pointed out before, but I want to say it even clear, more clearly now. Another really important branch of our immune system is our T cell response, which is another way that we actually fight off um, viruses. And there are some studies assessing um, how well our T cell responses do uh, especially once we've mounted one of those against a vaccine and then how well that might do actually against the virus variants. Um, I have not seen those kinds of papers pop out yet for a bunch of these different vaccines, but there was one that came out uh, for AstraZeneca vaccine just the other day with T cell responses against the South Africa variant. And in fact, that study was part of the basis for the WHO saying, even though that vaccine trial in South Africa didn't seem to show very much efficacy against that variant, we still think that vaccine actually will do something for you because your T cell response still seem to be partially effective against the, the virus. So that's the second kind of data that, that I think people, if they want to kind of try to follow the news with a careful eye in mind, should look for is, um, is what are all the different arms of our immune system? And the most important ones to think about are our antibody response plus our T cell response. And do we have some efficacy of our T cell response to the vaccine that protects us against the given variant we're interested in? So I hope that maybe answers a little bit part of that further, but we just, um, the, the only real way to really get definitive evidence would be to run a little bit of a trial of these vaccines, either in one of these places where the variant is, is circulating, and have some sort of comparison, com, excuse me, comparison group to really know for sure, or a, a human trials challenge trial, which have not been done yet. Right. So, uh, other series of questions about the variants for those of us who have not been vaccinated yet: Are there things that we can do or should do differently because these variants are circulating, such as not travel to the UK or South Africa, and does this somehow protect us against these variants? Sure. So, um, so there's been quite a bit of tr under, uh, interest in trying to understand how how best can we minimize the impacts of variants. One of the big challenges in um, so I think at the individual level, everything you said is like fantastic and spot on. We obviously individually can do things to reduce our chance of becoming infected and moving it around as we travel. I think that's that's a great comment to make. Uh, a bigger question is should countries close off their borders um, to stop the importation of variants? The answer to that is actually a weird kind of twofold answer. One is, is that there is a benefit of doing so, but if you're trying to do it against a specific country or specific variant, you're probably already too late. For, so for example, many countries have said, ah, we're just not gonna let anyone from South Africa come here. And the challenge of course, is that even though South Africa was the first place we found one of these variants, by the time we found it there, it actually had already spread to a bunch of other countries. So the only real way to prevent certain variants from getting into a given country would be to basically have all travelers uh, probably be quarantined and tested in the kind of standard things we know about reducing the importation of the virus at all, let alone any given variants. So at the individual level, definitely traveling less uh, will reduce the chance of spreading variants around. And at the country level, the better our uh, systems are in place for reducing infected people uh, coming in by traveling, the better. And that's, that's quarantining, testing, all those kinds of things that we want to do. But of course, that all comes with some costs in terms of making travel and those kinds of things more difficult. So it's impossible to take a three-day trip if you have to quarantine for two weeks. Right. Also, I mean, it's it's also important to point out that these are the variants that we know about. And, you know, just restricting travel to places where we know there are specific variants doesn't mean that we're um, going to do anything to curb the spread of other potentially arising variants, as we know Absolutely. are happening as the virus yeah. are evolving. Um, so what about other things that we can do to protect ourselves? How has the guidance changed with regard to wearing masks or two masks or which particular masks and, and being outside and wearing masks? And, and how does this all change because of the vaccine? Okay, super. Yeah, so those are good questions. So um, so uh, we, we know that the a couple of these viruses appear to be more infectious. So that means that they're likely, the person's either, uh, either exuding more virus, uh, exuding virus for longer, or the people on the other side, it's actually easier, more able to infect them. So the virus itself could be better at infecting people. So any of those pieces mean that any action that we take when that virus variant is around has a higher risk than it did before. However, the virus has not evolved an ability to magically say, pass through a mask, or kind of jump 50 feet or things like that. So the same measures that we were doing before in terms of masks, distance, ventilation, things like that are still um, the main tools we have to reduce the chance of infection, which is fantastic. So the measures are the same. Getting vaccinated we know also provides enormous amounts of protection. So those are kind of our new fourth tool. Um, but the other thing that I think is worth pointing out is that 
uh, when we first uh, kind of recognized that that masks were an important tool in our arsenal, we just wanted everyone to get their hands on a mask of any kind because that would reduce the amount of kind of uh, things that we're spitting out as we breathed and talked. We knew even back then that there were different kinds of masks that were more or less effective. And now, uh, given that we're kind of moving into this next phase, it's better if we can actually get better and better masks. And so now, for example, we it's very clear, for example, that certain kinds of masks that are single layer piece of cloth are not nearly going to be as effective as say a triple mesh mask or things like that. It's also super well known that if you have a mask on and you breathe and the air is passing around the sides of your mask versus through the mesh of the mask itself, that's obviously not gonna be as effective either. And so these ideas that people have probably heard about in the news of either double masking or certain kinds of masks that are well fitted to their face, those are all efforts for us to get most of the air that we breathe in or out to pass through that actual mesh of the mask in front of you and for the mesh of that mask not to be kind of a single cloth layer, but to be at least a couple layers. And um, there's some criteria that kind of go further than that, but, but that general trend is the important thing that we need to keep in mind. So there's a series of questions about vaccines and how you can change your behavior after you're vaccinated. And a lot of the questions um, revolve around travel and specifically travel to visit family, um, elderly parents or people with children. Um, once your elderly parents are vaccinated, is it safe to travel to see them? Um, is it safe to bring your kids who don't have a vaccine to see them? Um, what sort of precautions should people use when they're making this sort Sort of decision? Sure, that's a little bit of a tough question. Um, I guess I'll, <laughs> I will give, I think, the scientific answer, and then I think the answer that a, a number of people are trying to express, because life is actually all about kind of a risk-reward kind of trade-offs. So, um, so I tried to lay this out a little bit carefully in one of the slides, which is to say that once you get vaccinated, your chance of getting sick, either mildly or severely, is greatly diminished. So, um, so for example, the, the uh, vaccine we know the most about, I think that data are the most rigorous is the Moderna vaccine. Your chance of getting any sort of symptomatic infection at all is 95% lower, that's fantastic. And then we don't actually know exactly the risk for severe disease because it was 30 to zero, which we know it's not 100%, but that's pretty darn good. So, so that's fantastic. So the chance of, let's say your elderly relative, if they've been vaccinated, you getting infected say on the airplane and infecting them and them getting very sick is greatly, greatly diminished. Is it zero? No, it's probably not zero. Is it a much, much lower number? Yes, so that's good. So I think that people that need to use that information to decide, okay, can they still take as many precautions as they can to not get infected on the way there? And if they do by low chance get infected, the chance that they'll go on to infect and cause very serious illness in their elderly relative who's now vaccinated is now greatly diminished. So I think that's, that's the big positive. The flip side that's I think a little more challenging to answer is that what if you're not vaccinated, but they're vaccinated, there is a chance that they could actually infect you um, by, by being a carrier, but not getting that sick themselves. Um, the data that I've seen suggests that's actually relatively low, but we don't have a good enough data to really hammer down exactly the percent yet to kind of give you a nice informed number like we do with the other side of the, the equation. So, um, so I personally, uh, so my mother has been vaccinated now, which is fantastic. She's 78 years old, so she's in that high risk group. Um, and so once I'm vaccinated and my mother is, well, my mother's already vaccinated, but once I was able to get vaccinated, then I would actually feel comfortable going and hanging out with her because then I know that the chance of her getting infected and passing it to me, the odds of me getting very sick are very low. And if I get infected and pass it to her, the odds that she gets very sick are relatively low. So that's the, um, that's where, and the kind of risk trade-off that I think about it. I think if both people are vaccinated and it's a, and it's a something you really, you know, your family members, you really care about a lot, um, then I'm going to feel comfortable doing that. However, let's say there's only 10 or 15% of the population that's vaccinated. Am I going to go to a rock concert with 500 other people? I think then I might not want to do that until most of those other people are also vaccinated and the level of virus in their community is lower because then the chance that I get infected there is much, much higher. So that's that extra piece to it where I feel like myself and I think a number of people that recognize the important emotional connections we have with other people mean that I think if we can get the risk of severe illness in both of us down to a low enough level, then we're willing to take a little bit of a risk in doing so. Whereas other kinds of interactions that might have a much higher chance of infection in the first place, meaning say a rock concert with hundreds of other people, we might wanna wait till there's a little bit lower transmission in the community before we do that. Yes, thanks for that. I, I think it is really important for people to be able to consider the, the risks of, of other things, including the risks of not traveling. I know my, my parents have just gotten the first dose of their vaccine and my eight-year-old said to me the other day, when do they get the second dose? I said, February 22. And he said, great, are we booking our flight to go see them on the 23rd? Because <laughs> he hasn't seen them in more than a year. And you know, so this is also... There's a risk associated with denying people this sort of connection as well. Absolutely. And 
Speaking of denying people these sorts of connections and also my eight-year-old child, let's talk a little bit about getting back to school and vaccines and getting back to school and children. Um, in a lot of communities, there's been a lot of discussion, arguments, <laughs> real contention about the possibility of reopening schools, um, either before the teachers are vaccinated or after the teachers are vaccinated, either with all sorts of strategies in place to limit contact, like hybrid models, et cetera. Um, what do you know about um, vaccines for children and the trials that are ongoing right now, and also about children as vectors and the, the specific dangers associated with maybe teachers being vaccinated, but children not yet being vaccinated? And what can we as a community imagine is going to happen with schools? This is a big question, but it's close to my heart and other people who are asking questions. So I look sure. forward to your answer. Okay. I will try. That's actually a, could be a, certainly a talk for a, a topic for an entire talk. Um, so I'll try to do it in uh, maybe one, one or two minutes. So the, as I think you've really nicely laid out, the, the data we have so far indicates that the risk of, in, of infection and severe disease and death, as I showed on one of my slides, for children is very low. It's been actually one of the, if you can consider it a bright side of this uh, pandemic, has been that it really doesn't uh, seem to cause severe disease in children very often. It's, it's really, really low risk of that. So there are um, a very rare but um, uh, severe cases in children. They do occur, but thankfully they're relatively rare. So the real risk in schools um, has been primarily of children getting infected and either infecting the teacher or a child getting infected and then say infecting another child and then that person bringing that infection home to either their parents or their grandparents or other people like that. So, so that's been the real risk. And so, uh, so the two things that, that people have um, developed that I think can help us with that. Number one is, is that um, as people may or may not know, the CDC released a, a giant report on kind of guidance for schools just in the past week. Um, and it was a real uh, pretty helpful positive step forward. Um, but left a few things vague. And I think that's actually part of the questions that you're asking. So, so the things that are in there that are good are that, um, that we have really good data now from both the US and as well as a bunch of other countries that when schools can have a couple measures in place and the main, main three that people have used that seem to be really quite effective are masks, um, some distancing and some ventilation or some form of that uh, in, the, in the classrooms um, and cohorts. Those are kind of our best tools we've had pre-vaccine. So basically, there's been a bunch of schools that have been that have occurred in place, excuse me, in person, um, sometimes in communities that actually had quite a bit of virus circulating. And when they did that, but they had those measures in place, transmission within schools was extremely low. So that's the like fantastic good news. And that's actually what's allowed um, a lot of places to, to have in-person schooling. And in fact, the CDC guidelines say if you can have these things, you actually can have in-person school even without, they say that vaccinating teachers is not required. And so they, they purposely didn't put that bullet in there under the guidance of like, don't open schools until teachers are vaccinated. Because we have this good data that suggests if you can do these measures, schools are relatively safe uh, for the teachers. So that's fantastic. And even between student to student transmission has been very low as well in those schools. So that's fantastic. The challenge comes, which is that some schools simply because of the way the buildings are designed, how old the buildings are, how much resources they have, can't do some of these things. Um, so they either don't have the space to have, say, distance between desks. That's been a challenge. Um, some buildings have really crappy ventilation, and so people are stuck in rooms with basically not ventilation, maybe no windows. So that part gets really hard. And those things we do, we do know elevate the risks of transmission. Um, and then, of course, we also know, as I said previously before, that the chance for severe disease is higher the older you are. And so, of course, the teachers are at much higher risk than that. So, um, so vaccination of teachers, I think, is, is fantastic and should be highly prioritized because it does protect those that are at highest risk of infection at school. So I think everyone agrees on that part. And that's fantastic. Um, it's mostly just a question of uh, you're trying to you know, prioritize one group versus prioritizing another group, and none of those decisions are kind of easy to make. But, but that for certainly is a, is a great tool. The other tool that can be quite helpful, but is also costly and challenging is to use testing, and especially frequent testing, to basically find infection in schools and reduce the chance of the virus being passed around. But that's, and that, when that can be done, again, it's fantastic, but some places basically can't afford that possibility. So. Um, so what do I guess, we know about please, the vaccines for children? Um, what, what yeah, is okay, so sure, yeah. So the, the short, terrible answer is nothing. So no vaccine actually has even been studied at all in children. There are, I think, last I checked, three trials just starting or have already enrolled some people um, right now to study the vaccines in children. I think the youngest one I've seen is 12 and up. I actually haven't seen a trial starting of younger kids. I might've missed one because it's just been the past week or two, but there's basically a bunch of trials starting up um, in, in children all the vaccines that are out there now are in the 16 and older or 18 and older. 
and we certainly need to vaccinate children at some point. Um, so you asked, one of your other questions was, um, can children get infected and transmitted? And what do we know about that? And then now the proponents of evidence that I've seen so far suggest that um, definitely children can get infected. We know that for a fact. We definitely know children can then pass on the virus. The data suggests that they're probably less likely to do so both directions, both less likely to get infected and less likely to infect other people, but not so low that you could not have any measures in place and not worry about it. So it's this thing where if you have some measures in place, the data are very convincing that schools can be relatively safe if you have the resources or space or ventilation to do it. But if you don't, and you don't have masking, and you don't have any of these things in place, then you definitely will get transmission if there's transmission in the community. So it's this kind of thing where you basically can't ignore it, but you also can do things to basically create safe environments. So the combination of those things is, is good. So then the vaccine question is, why do we not have any vaccines for kids yet? And the answer is, is because obviously the people getting sick and dying were older people, so we targeted them first. And I think there's a little bit of hesitancy for some vaccine makers to say start trials in kids because of course we feel very sensitive about kids getting sick or having any sort of side effects. So now that we know that the vaccines are very safe in older people, we're trying them in kids um, and how fast we get results back will depend uh, in this slightly, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Terrible way that the more transmission is occurring, the faster we'll get results back from these vaccine trials. So we hope of course that there's no transmission and we can't get our data back, but at the, the other hand, it'll take us many more months to get us data for these uh, randomized control trials. So, um, so most people think that we'll have data on the first set of trials in children on the order of three to four months from now. Um, and so we hope that those end up being effective. And then if so, then obviously we roll out vaccinations to kids, um, at, at least in the 12 and up group, and hopefully some of the younger kids as well. And I haven't seen those yet, but I would be, it would shock me if there aren't trials in younger kids also starting in the next month or two. So a related quick question about the vaccines um, with all the trials and the vaccine. What do we know so far? And I recognize that it's not much about how long a vaccine is going to be um, useful in a particular person? Are we going to need booster shots? And how frequently is this something like the annual flu vaccine? Or is it going to be more like MMR, where we only have to get it a few times during our lives? Yeah, so whew, I wonder if I should just turn you back and make you answer that question. So <laughs> I would say that um, there's a bunch of data accumulated in the past two weeks or so, a bunch of neat studies looking at reinfections. Um, and they say two things. So I think I've seen four studies in the past month or so, and they say two things. One is, is that previous infection, and again, all these studies are against um, kind of the same variant so far. So I'll, I'll say one additional thing about the variants, which complicates everything. But without the variants involved, uh, immunity against the same kind of virus um, seems to be pretty effective and, protect, and seems to confer on the order of between like 80 and 95-ish percent uh, protection against subsequent exposure a few months later. And there's been a few studies that are on the order of like six or eight months after infection. So it seems to, seems to be like your protection would last at least that long. And very importantly, those that got reinfected, uh, the, the disease was sometimes like all asymptomatic or much, much less uh, severe. So more mild infections. So it appears that our, if we get infected, we get some immunity and it seems to protect us against severe disease for quite a while, for sure on the order of six to eight months, possibly longer than that but some people can certainly still get reinfected afterwards. And that fraction on the order of 10-ish percent uh, on the six to eight month kind of time span, that's the day that I've seen so far. That's all been with the kind of same virus floating around. With the new variant, there's new variants. There's just a little bit of data out there and the data that's there is hard to interpret, but in one of the trials, they didn't see much protection from past exposure against one of the new variants. Um, it's hard to interpret the data because the comparison of the two groups is not a kind of placebo kind of randomized trial thing. So there's some reasons that if you're previously a high chance of getting infected, you might have a high chance of getting re-exposed, higher chance than the kind of person that wasn't exposed in the first place. So interpreting those data are tough, but they're strong enough to say that that variant was doing pretty good job at basically being able to evade the immune system of the previous um, people who've been previously exposed. So, so my guess is that we will probably have annual shots, closer to annual shots than the kind of, you know, three times in our whole lifetime, something like that. Um, I hope it's not more frequent than that. And I would bet that if you didn't get it more frequent than that, you would just have a higher chance of getting a flu-like or a cold, you know, common cold-like illness, not a chance of kind of dying, things like that. So that's my my guess about it with the data that we have so far. But um, if you know of any additional things on that, I'd love to hear your comments on viral evolution or things like that that could change that pattern. <laughs> I was just going to say that this is just another reason that um, it's important that we really try to 
get down the number of infections. The smaller the population size of this virus that's circulating, the less likely it is that new variants are going to crop up and become more common in the population. You know, this really is an example of how evolution works in real time. We are watching it happen. And if we can stop the spread, then maybe we can stop the spread of these newer variants and the emergence of new variants. Um, we are out of time. Um, there are loads of questions that I did not get to, and I am very sorry about this. I tried to pick a few from each category, um, but I would like to thank you again, Marm, for an excellent talk, super informative. You know more about this virus than I think I've heard on all of the news things that I've read, and I am thrilled that we have all gotten to experience and learn from you. Um, your experience, your knowledge, and learn from you tonight. And I'm sure you will be asked to do this again, and everyone will be will be looking out for it. So um, please join me in thanking Marm again. And ha, yes. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you very much, Ben. <laughs> Okay, and thank, thank you, Marm and Beth, so much uh, for this um, incredibly interesting presentation and so much work that went into it. It's hard to imagine a, a, another subject that's as compelling right at the moment, it really is. We're gonna try though next week, there's a second uh, crawl lecture on February 24th, the third of three focused on climate change Forecasting the Future of a Changing Ocean with Associate Professor Christy uh, Croker and Professor Rafe Kudela. And so I hope everyone can come back and join us for another lecture. But I wanna just add another thank you so much to both of you for, for this effort. It's been amazing. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.